for anyone that's worked in the transportation industry for longer than a minute, chances are you've experienced something that strained our mental health. So a number of, exa of examples that come to mind when I think about my own experience, first operating a commercial vehicle in heavy traffic to planning trucks and all of a sudden a breakdown happens and you're scrambling trying to basically solve the problem to ensure you can plan that load. So as we navigate through these challenges and ultimately create our own victories, um, a lot of this action has an impact on our mental health. So it's possible that even right now, you're feeling less like yourself, especially over the last few months, then maybe you prefer, hey, this is who I am. I definitely know I have. And that's why I'm so passionate about this series. This is the We Got It series, and it's all about mental health. And it's all about learning ways to be proactive in protecting and strengthening our mental health as we continue to navigate these different challenges that's just common in the transportation industry. So we all need to understand that our mental health needs to be taken seriously. And there's a number of actions that we can take each day, literally moment by moment, minute by minute, to strengthen and protect our own mental health. So there's also situations that require medical attention, and by no means do I claim to be a medical expert, but I do, do know that these exist. So regardless where you're at, I'm really excited for this series and just the different leaders that I get to introduce to create an impact. So most importantly, if you're in a mental state where you feel lost, confused, uncertain, please reach out. You can reach out to myself just for a call or reach out to someone that's definitely more of a medical professional, but make sure that you reach out. So in today's episode, I'm really excited to have a conversation with my friend Morgan Baudry. She's the owner of Road Ahead Counseling, and it's all about professional drivers, trauma, post-collision, and the need for them to have a safe place to share their story to protect their own mental health. I'm really excited again, because this is part of our We Got This series. This is interview one of two with Morgan, which is super empowering, just because I really respect what she has to say. So throughout Morgan's journey, she's learned so much about the importance of sharing our stories, especially after a traumatic, a traumatic experience, um, such as a motor vehicle collision. So far too often, the conversation stops once you hear something like, well, an accident happened, the driver was deemed not at fault, they must be okay. So as we know, they're not okay. And in today's episode, which is part one with Morgan, I'm really excited just to hear her perspective on just the different things that she sees and how she helps professional drivers. Well, let's get to it. Morgan, welcome to the Truck Focus podcast. Honestly, super excited for today. Even some of the stuff we were just talking about off camera, I'm just like, A, I really appreciate your intelligence, but I also appreciate your humility. And I think this our episode or our interview today, I should say, there's gonna be a lot of value offered. So I just, well, welcome. Thank you so much. You're really welcome, Josh. It's such a pleasure to be here this morning, to be with you. Um, I love your podcast. I've been enjoying it for some weeks now. And it's a, just a delight to be included in, uh, in such company. I appreciate that. Spend some time with you today. Appreciate that very much. And yeah, thanks for taking the time to listen. There's, yeah, I really appreciate just the support. And I just, yeah, this journey has been awesome. So it's great to hear feedback. So thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. So why don't you kind of start us off and highlight who's Morgan um, and talk a little bit about your experience in the transportation industry, but also in the health and safety industry. Oh, absolutely. So who is Morgan? Morgan is somebody who is always asking questions and who is curious and who always wants to know more. My career began in uh, journalism formally, and then I went to work in politics for a while, but the through line through all of my career, be it with nonprofits and communications and policy work and um, working in any communications department, really, be it government or private sector, has been helping people tell their story. All policy is really grounded in stories. When people write a letter to a minister, they're writing a story. This is the story of my situation and we're writing back, well, this is the story of our whatever. But then I had this incredible opportunity um, to work in the transportation industry. In journalism, I worked uh, a lot with traffic safety, with police, um, mostly involving collisions, fatal collisions on Highway 17, um, through Kenora, Ontario, through the Dryden area down to Thunder Bay. It's a very dangerous road. And it profoundly affected me and what I saw and what I heard and what I covered in the courtroom and witnessed um, on collision scenes stay with me and really influenced my choices when I had the opportunity to do traffic safety and driver examination with Saskatchewan government insurance. Um, I wanted to learn more about um, 
some of the, the reasons that we have the policies that we do and some of the reasons that uh, make people tick and make them successful or unsuccessful uh, in a driving environment. I started graduate school in 2016. I was introduced to my topic by the very truckers I worked with because there were certain things we talked about in trucking. And then you notice how sometimes when people aren't talking about a topic that becomes conspicuous. So I started noticing what we weren't talking about and started considering it. And then I switched my entire program over to a research project that became a thesis. And the subject was on how does trauma on the job affect truckers' lives, affect their professional lives and their personal work lives. So yeah, it's quite the trajectory, but it's all still about storytelling and enabling others to find their own voice and to speak it loudly. That's powerful. And I, I think what's really exciting is you've seen so many different perspectives. So I, I find there's a great divide between a professional driver, a carrier, and law enforcement, and we can include government in that conversation. And being experienced, basically multifaceted to a point where you could identify, no one's talking about this and why not? I think that's really powerful how you've used your journey to better society, but obviously the better industry and more so even just the people that you work closely with to allowing them to actually speak and to say, hey, this is what's going on. I'm going to tell you my story and you're willing to listen with that experience so you can kind of, I guess, piece it together from all perspectives. I think that's a really unique um, skill set for sure. Well, and I have the good fortune of being in a faculty that's called interdisciplinary. So it's a bit of this and a bit of that and seeing the linkages or seeing the parallels or seeing the connections between things that may look unrelated on the surface, but are actually closely related or influence each other in a sort of a systems way and an interdisciplinary way. So um, uh, there is a whole faculty dedicated to encouraging science and encouraging research that taps into all of these different factors. And on paper, someone might look at my resume and say, good God, you've done, you know, so many different things. How, you know, why do you keep jumping around? And I'm like, well, is it different things or is it just, you know, through a different lens, am I exploring um, different environments for the same kind of knowledge? Yeah, I think being a hybrid is key, especially when you're trying to create an impact on a topic that, yes. yeah, that's something that I self-identify as all the time, because if you look at, say, my professional resume, professional driver, business owner, um, yeah, hiring manager to consult, all of these different tasks, and you could basically ask the same type of question, and I'm like, no, I want to be a hybrid so I can impact greater and I can actually identify and lead with empathy. So I think you're doing that is, yeah, through this experience for this amount of time led me to this experience for this amount of time that essentially here I am today. So I think that's really powerful. And right. yeah, not I didn't use your fancy word though. <laughs> yeah, no, try not to. Um, I have to call it something. Um, I, I sometimes call the Swiss Army knife. Yes. Because there's a tool for everything or, or just the toolbox because Every single thing you, I mean, and this is up to you, if you want to take something from your environment and add it to your toolbox as a skill or a skill set, and you know, you don't maybe know when you're going to use it or how, but it's nice to have it in there. It really is. So I like to collect all the tools. I love that. Yeah, that was. And again, like typing, great tool to have. Excellent for academic work and also wonderful for um, online stuff. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I think a couple of things too, when we're talking about the toolbox, that was going to be one question that I had that I was hoping we could dive into. Um, I love the Swiss army knife um, analogy. I love the toolbox analogy. And also on our prior conversation, you're talking about a pre-trip on ourselves too, which I also really relate to that mentality. So a couple of things I really want to get into. And I think, yeah, they all fit. They all yeah. connect. We'll get to those. Yes. Yeah, no, Absolutely. So in your journey then, at what point did you, was it, I guess, a specific event where you're like, no one's talking about trauma? Is it a, a series of events that you're like, no one's looking out for professional drivers post-incident? Or how did you kind of get to where you are now where you're, you're done school, you're just at your thesis part, correct? If that's correct. Like, how did you get to this part of life? 
Well, I was actually about two thirds of the way um, to finishing my courses to, to get my degree. I was originally doing course based masters and there had been um, in the morning, early morning, a suicide by truck um, quite nearby. And the details were coming out in the news that it was a person with dementia who just stepped out on a highway in front of a commercial truck driver. But what I thought was peculiar about the story, and I probably only flagged this because I come from journalism, was it didn't talk a lot about how the trucker was doing. The story centered the, the scene. And, and you can imagine what a scene like that looks like. It, it's not pretty and it's very traumatizing. So the story talked about how the EMTs that came to address the scene were profoundly affected and were given access to counseling. It spoke to the experiences of revulsion and disgust and horror of people driving by the scene or people who witnessed it in their vehicles and the trauma that could flow from that. And I'm waiting for it and I'm waiting for it. And then there's one line in the story that the driver is, you know, is, is, is doing well. And um, that's about it and not facing charges. And I'm like, but how is he doing? Um, is he getting counseling? So the story focused on everybody else as a witness, but not the singular experience of being in the wrong place in the wrong vehicle at the wrong time. He actually caused this death, whether he was the instrument of this death, it wasn't really his cause and it certainly wasn't his fault. And of course it's appropriate that he's not charged, but his experience was direct and visceral. And of course, when we're talking about witnessing, he saw it all and probably will never unsee it. So this haunted me. It haunted me that the public was being fed a narrative that centered everybody but the trucker. The trucker, because they're not facing charges, is out of sight, out of mind. Oh, they're fine. They're not facing charges. But I'm like, are they fine? So that morning I had to do testing at a truck school and I brought it up. I'm like, hey, anybody hear about the story? And everybody's, yeah, we've heard about it. What do you think of that? how do you think the trucker is doing? And they just kind of looked at each other and said, oh, he's probably going to retire. And I'm like, why air quotes? What does that mean? And they said, well, it'll be like the guy who a couple of years ago killed that high school student who ended up in front of him on the wrong side of, um, on the highway. He's just not going to want to drive anymore. And I'm like, well, why are we talking about that in air quotes though? Why isn't he going to drive? Now I'm peppering them with a thousand questions and I'm supposed to be there for work. And I'm like, there's something happening here that we're not talking about, but that everybody knows about. There's this secret, quiet conversation that does take place within the trucking industry, among peers, in the community, with intimates, with friends. But it's something the public knows next to nothing about and I really started to wonder, well, does academia know anything about this? I contacted my department head. She says, you know, that's a good question. You should go find out. So I did the academic equivalent of Googling and looked for studies and papers. And there just wasn't a whole lot. And there was very little from Canada or referencing Canada. There's some good um, actual studies from the United States on trucking and mental health. But it, those studies themselves too, took place in truck stops where you don't really dive deeply into the person's narrative, like how are they experiencing this, which was really the question that has been troubling me from the get-go. So I thought, well, I guess the only way we're going to find out is by finding out. So uh, I radically changed my whole program. I was in smooth in six months of graduate and um, chucked it all to do a massive research project because uh, this was such a really important topic and a good opportunity. Plus, I had the incredible good fortune of holding a commercial driver's license um, as part of my role. I was somewhat part of the trucking community and I had access to the trucking community. So when you have an opportunity this rich, it would be, um, I think, morally reprehensible to, to do anything else. Yeah, the uh, phrase I often use, and I use it in a 
in a polite, respectful manner is a lot of times the industry is voiceless. So I get, I get really empowered and excited when I see someone actually being a voice and asking the whys and lifting up the rocks and checking under the rugs and being like, okay, this is a problem. Like commercial vehicle collisions is not new. It's been going on probably since horse and carriage and before. So when you think about the length of time, but the lack of resources, the lack of conversations and the approach of, oh, you'll be fine. No, yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. And facing charges, it's all good. Nothing to see here, folks move along. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's a really terrible approach because at the end of the day, we're all human. And I think the human factor for professional drivers is oftentimes, well, it's very regularly overlooked. We see that with the pandemic, with the lack of bathrooms, you know, you can't come in here to eat, let alone you deal with something where if it's suicide by truck or if it's just a, a fender bender and you're a hundred thousand pounds and you are involved in the collision with a 6,000 pound car and a young mom comes out and she's freaking out. That doesn't just leave you the next day. Like that's something that I'm grateful for your research and your hours upon hours, because yeah, it's, it's shocking how there's minimal to no resources. Even like I'm a trained safety professional. I'm trained in collision evaluations and that journey of it and minimal talk on how's a driver. How do you respond to a driver post-accident? Not, what do you mean there's an accident? Are you okay? Like, you, I don't care about anything else right now. Are you okay? And that's been my focus since I kind of discovered my empathetic side a handful of years ago where I'm like, yeah, something bad happened, but are you okay? And yeah, I think what you're doing is powerful. And it's, it's nice that you were strong enough to ask these questions to people that probably didn't want to talk to. And maybe there's some ignorance there. I know in the media, sometimes it's skewed to one direction, but yeah, it's, I'm encouraged by what you're doing. Thank you. Um, well, when I, when I thought about doing this research, I thought, well, it needs to be done, but I also want to very much position the truckers, if you will, put them in the driver's seat of this. So how can I do that? Because I want their voices to be the one that is heard in the research. So while I was in school, I learned about different ways of doing research. Um, there are some things called participatory research, which is where the people who are taking part in the research as subjects actually get to define and decide the direction of the research. Because if the research is about them, well, aren't they the experts? Shouldn't they be in the driver's seat? Shouldn't they be steering the questions? So, and when we started doing the design of the study, it's not just, well, what do we want to learn? How do we want to learn it? And the best way to tell stories about how you're affected by trauma is creating a space where people can unpack that story in their own time, on their own terms, in ways that are rich and in ways that honor their voice and also in symbolic ways. So we use something called arts-based research. Um, in my case, it was called photo voice. And so what you do is you have your research question and then you, the, the participants in the group, they respond to it with a photograph that represents their answer, but then they tell a story about the photo. So they are answering the question, but in a slightly more sideways fashion, which produces richer answers. Is this harder than doing a truck stop survey, which is where most of the research on truckers, yes, but I'm also after a different level of insight, a different level of experience. It's kind of hard to really un uncover your soul to a complete stranger with a clipboard in a truck stop. Surveys aren't designed for that. Surveys are important because they've told us this is a problem. Surveys have uncovered that, well, many different things about trucker trauma, but that it exists that the, the stresses of the trucking life can actually take an average of 16 years occupationally off your life versus other professions. This is what we know from trucking studies now. We know what the hazards are to truckers, isolation, um, monotony, uh, sitting in the same place. Um, one, one incredible author, the title of his book is Sweatshops on Wheels because you're, you're clamoring for low KV with very little agency in your job, very little say in what you do, all these pressures and very, very little control of your environment. Add to that that we're all still human. So you still have family problems. You still have regular ordinary losses. 
but you're going to miss out on events. You're going to have fewer communications and fewer time with your intimates, your friends, your family. So add those pressures in and then add a trauma, a catastrophic, horrifying, very frightening episode. Well, we need to have a longer conversation to unbottle that. So the whole research was designed about, I'm going to create a space, you're going to come and talk. And I'm going to come up with a couple questions, but I'm also going to create a space where you're going to workshop your own ideas for questions. Because what we can't lose sight of here, and this was the center of the study from the very go, is we don't know very much about the interior lives of truckers. So let's not guess, let's ask them. So I have three questions, y'all. Um, by week four, you're gonna be asking the questions. So what should we talk about next? What makes logical sense? Who has a topic? Let's do that. And those were the four most interesting questions of the whole study, actually. The ones that the truckers came up with. Yes. Because they took us deeper into our world and they taught, they taught us about so here's what's real to us. Here's what matters. Here's how trauma is affecting us and in different ways and taking apart our lives. And here's how it's hard to recover and why. Breathtaking. Yeah, um, I was facilitator on this. I was along for the ride, shotgun. That was it. Powerful. I built the truck, they drove it. Yeah, I was gonna ask the, uh, the response. I Initially, when we first spoke, I wondered, okay, if someone's offered the opportunity to be vulnerable, how would they respond? And I think at a truck stop, they they fight stigma, they fight who are you, and the two second, hey, I, like that doesn't really work. But being in a safer place and being in an environment where you kind of, well, you gave them a, the stage in the sense where, okay, we're going to work through these three, you're next. And I, yeah, so there, I'm assuming then the res well, their journey, do you find it was helpful? I guess is the question after they opened up and after they kind of dove through it, do you find that they were able to maybe see things that they didn't see before? They were able to get essentially something off of their chest per se, or how did they respond after that entire study was done? Well, even during the recruitment stage, I had, we didn't know what would happen with recruitment because this was such a new idea and doing it in such a new way. So it was a crapshoot. We said, well, all right, let's hope for a minimum of eight a maximum of 12, is anyone gonna come to this party? I don't know, let's send out the invitations. So many people tried to get into the party because they actually thought it was therapy. No one has ever asked me about this part of my life. I feel very alone. If you're studying this, will I get to talk to others and be with others? It was heartbreaking how many people just simply had never been asked to talk about what they had been through. This was just not a topic that came up and nobody was interested in exploring it with them. So yeah, um, I ended up taking on 15 because I honest to God didn't know how to say no. Um, and for the record, everybody showed up. One person ghosted it, flaked out. Everybody else showed up at least once and half of the group showed up every single week. It took place in an online space. So they could also, and you know, to answer the second part of that question, yeah, they did respond to each other. They could see each other's work as it went up. And so like Facebook, I created a commenting section where they could react and respond and converse between themselves. Everybody was anonymous in the study we used. Um, it was called Knights of the Road. So we had a Sir something or other as their names. They got to choose them. And they immediately showed empathy. Uh, they led with empathy. What a terrible thing to go through. If you ever need support and help, I would love to hook you up or there's the name of this group that I know. So they instantly started supporting each other as part of the process of unbottling their own experience. It was extraordinary to behold. Also not terribly surprising if you know anything about truckers in the trucking community. Yes. 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 Yeah. The, uh, I think that's one of the best things that I, well, 
I comb. I monitor lots online in the trucking community because you can't be everywhere at once, but it's quite easy to monitor a handful of Facebook groups and just what are people talking about? What are people concerned about? And that's the best, in my opinion anyway, that's the best response is when someone says something and someone's like, man, I've been there before. How can I help? Because right there, it's just like, okay, that's the compassionate side of our industry that again, isn't talked about enough. It's not really brought to light ever but when someone's willing to say if that's in a one-on-one -on -one environment a group environment a virtual environment hey i've been there how can i help or hey i've never been there but how can i help i think that shows the real strength of professional drivers too is it's a really tight-knit community even when it's not a tight-knit community but it's nice to hear that's the response that you had absolutely and that actually mirrored um something i saw happening in many truck groups uh in the wake of the broncos collision I was actually ready to do my recruitment that week when Broncos happened. So because of that, and then I saw what was being discussed and the Broncos really brought home for a lot of drivers, their own individual horrors, because when a terrible thing happens and you've been there, suddenly you were reliving it now. That past, you haven't gone into the past, rather the past has come forward, you are re-experiencing it, which is characteristic of PTSD, acute anxiety, and things like that. So I immediately knew that we had to suspend my study. It was going no further until this case wrapped up because the Broncos is, is a once in, well, there has never been anything like it, and God grant there never is again. I did not want to do my, my study in the shadow of this. This is not the reason for the research. The reason for the research is ordinary people who don't become international news in Germany are also going through this every day and we're not doing it in the shadow of an exceptional event. Also, because everyone that I was going to want to talk to had triggered. They were enduring terrible pain and in the groups, moderators were like, I would love to have some volunteers to keep an eye on certain members and just check in with them. People are needing a lot of support. So can you please be kind? Can you please be compassionate um, and you know, keep the discussion? It was remarkable how many side conversations were taking place, supporting the truckers who were reliving their own trauma. And it was happening live on Facebook. Wow. So is that what sparked your business, A Road Ahead Counseling? Or how did everything you've been through, everything you've learned lead to, yeah, A Road Ahead Counseling? The, well, the road ahead was the first name that came because, of course, um, as we grow as people, we're all on a journey. A journey is like a road. A healing journey is like a road. Life is. Uh, there are pitfalls and bumps and collisions and breakdowns and having to ride along with others until we can drive ourselves. So the road just the, the road ahead just came naturally and organically. But the idea to pursue a therapist career, which I'm also doing, um, in tandem with my master's studies, just became um, an idea that evolved out of the uh, incredibly huge response in the recruitment because people were saying, well, we don't have anyone to talk to. Nobody understands, nobody believes, nobody asks. And it was quite heartbreaking, truly, truly heartbreaking. They were hoping it was group therapy. Well, can we do this on an ongoing basis? It's like, well, it's a research thing. Also, um, I had to screen certain people out of my study because of the risk. This is a, a topic. This is very emotional. And if you are really suffering, I'm not going to put you at greater suffering. So anyone who, who had PTSD diagnosis or was being treated or taking meds um, and was a high risk of suicide couldn't be in the study. And so many of the people that tried to get in were that person, the most vulnerable truckers. And they needed someone to talk to that believed them, that understood also what trucking was, that understood their world, their lives. So the seed was planted there and grew over time. Nice. Yeah, I think, so I've spoken in a couple environments where we're talking as a group of leaders, how do we better interact with professional drivers? How do we, yes. <laughs> it's kind of from a performance perspective. And I always go to, when was the last time you asked someone how they were doing? And just in basic conversation, not even post-collision conversation, just, hey, so-and-so, it could be male, female, it could be, they could be old, they could be young, does not matter. How are you doing today? 
What's it like? What's going on? And, and that's the key word is how are you doing today? Yeah. Which keeps it present, which also keeps it really sincere because you're asking. It's yeah. not performative. You're not asking, you're going, hey, how's it going? Um, you're, you're engaging in a real, I'm here for you and I'm actually listening and I'm accessible and I'm available and I'm interested. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that from a leadership standpoint in industry is often missed because people are looking at the numbers and the stats. And then again, I always go back to the human factor and I like that you're helping people and you're helping people overcome things that you and I could never imagine because we've just never been there, but you can, you have a great picture now because of all your experience and training and really the storytelling that you're getting told from this perspective and that perspective, but that, in my opinion, needs to be plugged into, I don't care the size of a carrier or an association, but how are we doing needs to start being the question. And like you said, today, like, I think what you're doing is so powerful and I'm just relating to different events that I've been to and different meetings I've been in. And I'm like, let's get away from performance meetings and let's start talking about how are people actually doing and how are we doing today and what do we need to do so to ensure people don't get to the point where that's where they're at. I think that that would be important. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly important and it's fundamental. And it's so fundamental, you'd think it would be obvious, but you know, crazy, it's not. And it's often the simplest things that we miss on. Ever since I got into the truck, I have gotten to go to places in my career and in my life because the truckers have taken me on this journey. They took me with them into their world and they took me into their lives. And in in a way, they steered me away from where I thought I was going. The destination isn't always what you imagine. Um, I was going to um, stay on an academic track Instead, I started taking mental health first aid courses, psychological um, health and safety in the workplace programming through um, Mental Health Commission of Canada and Canadian Mental Health uh, Organization. I just pivoted. So um, PhD, not likely, but working as an industry consultant to build in programming so that aren't just reactive, but proactive. Hey, let's get out in front of this before it's a thing. We need both in this industry. But we also need to be aware of the simple things, as you put it, being present, actually asking and being interested. So yeah, no, truckers took me along. They picked me up like a hitchhiker and I have been to places thanks to them and their patience and their generosity. Powerful. Yeah, they're incredible people as professionals, but this is people. And I think we have, I don't know, three or four direct in our family that like my father-in-law has been an over-the-road professional driver probably two or three years longer than I've been alive. And I'm just like, some of the stories and the fact that he always smiles and his first question is, how's the kids? How's the kid? I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, he's not the only one. I like, he's a super great guy, but I'm like, he's not the only one because you can talk to other people in a very humane environment <laughs> where it's not hierarchy ran. It's very personal. It's the same thing. How's your family? So what do you like to do when you're not behind the wheel? And how are you actually managing that while you're working 70 hours a week, while you're dealing with snowstorms, while you just dealt with this collision? Like, yeah, those are more of the conversations that we definitely need to have. And I'm really excited for just your business venture too, knowing the impact it's having. Well, and also there's so much opportunities, again, in my new world that the truckers dropped me off at, which is the world of counseling and therapy, therapists probably don't know a lot about the world of trucking because we don't know a lot about the world of trucking unless we are personally connected to it or personally know somebody in it. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen Ice Road Truckers yet, the terrible and bizarrely, yeah, anyway, less said about that, the better. But the way truckers are portrayed in television and in media is, well, they're not great people. They're almost never male. Well, they're almost always male. And this is just a caricature. This is a stereotype. This is an idea grounded in myth and mythology and doesn't represent people. So the public, though, is fed this. The same way that they're told by the press that the trucker who just killed someone is fine because they're not facing charges. Are they, though? So the real trucker themselves in their industry, this is a culture, this is a community that has resources for itself, but again, is also looking to be better, to improve itself. 
So opportunities, well, what can I do? Well, um, there's resources they need that could be better. So for example, I'm hoping to work with my supervisor on developing a program for therapists to work with truckers. Well, what do you know about the world of trucking? Anybody? Because giving you advice to de-escalate and maybe walk it off or hug a body pillow or phone a friend. This may not be practical and or possible if you are um, driving the Malahat today or the Coquihalla or if you're a storm state. And you don't always get to choose when your anxiety or your PTSD or your feelings or your loneliness and your frustration back up on you. In fact, many drivers don't know what the symptoms are. Also, that these symptoms are normal. You're experiencing a normal reaction to a terrible thing. It would be weird if you didn't have this kind of response. You also don't always get it. So doing some psychoeducation and teaching the helpers how to work with the trucking community. This is their world. And it's not their world according to me. This is their world according to truckers. Yes. You know, when uh, one of the most interesting things that came up in my research that it would pay for a therapist to know is the relationship that the trucker has to their vehicle, whether they own it themselves or whether it is a company vehicle, you know, they look after it, they take care of it. Words like spouse, friend, argument, companion, karaoke machine, hotel room, all of these were used to talk about the truck. People decal the names of their children on them, polish them on the weekends together as a family, and they have a pride of place in wedding photos and in events and in funerals where there's a profession to honor someone. So the vehicle is actually very much a workmate, a partner. Losing that vehicle is part of a collision has an emotional toll. Yes. So thinking about, and did they own it? And was it a lifetime project? Was it their first truck ever that they literally invested everything they have in? So there are emotional relationships here that are not tangential. These are really central to the mental health of the trucker themselves, is they have a relationship with the vehicle. Something that only truckers, I think, could have brought to this conversation, and thank God they did. Yes. Yeah, it's but a really good therapist about that. Um, you know, they didn't just lose a uh, cargo or some personal possessions or break a couple of bones. They're missing their friend. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I can relate to that. And you're absolutely right. I remember the first time you mentioned that to me too. I'm like, it is so true. Just it's a different type of bond. You it could be a deer jumped out in front of you good girl like you're just tapping the steering wheel saying thank you <laughs> like yeah. you stopped when you needed to you and but yeah you know there's the memories to I didn't have kids when I was still driving but when I picture myself with some of the people like we were at the truck stop there's a flying J about five minutes from our house I guess this would have been early summer when our father-in-law was here last because lived in a different province and just being around the truck and him being, oh, it's just this old, I'm like, no, this is awesome. Be proud of this. And like, yeah, there's a lot there that I don't think people take into account because a normal office job, you don't have that appreciation for a mouse and a keyboard and a cell phone. You're kind of like, oh, my mouse broke. You will get a different mouse. But yeah, when you have the time invested and the amount of times you're cleaning it to repairing it to the oohs, the ahs, you're right. That's a really big piece that I, I definitely see as being overlooked for sure. Well, and also that if the trucker's on the same route all the time and they have a collision there, well, they're going to be going past the site over and over and over. So realizing that there are um, geographical factors and also realizing that truckers see a lot, even when they're not directly involved in it, they see things, they stop and they help. So you can get PTSD and acute anxiety and response trauma over time and dealing with, well, how do you cope with things? So teaching coping skills in the moment, but understanding what the triggers are. You're sitting in an eight by eight vibrating box that smells like diesel all day. So this in itself is going to impact your mental health, the constant mental focus. So teaching helping professions about the world of the trucker, I think will make the helping professions a lot more um, useful to truckers but also teaching them that, of course, 
you, you think it, it goes unsaid, but truckers don't keep normal hours, especially long haul, because things get delayed, audibles get called, loads are late, loads are early. So there needs to be flexibility now if anything good came of COVID. It was that a lot of services, especially employee assistance programs, went to a digital format, went online. Now it's, so not only are you accessible with that, because you know, if the wheels aren't turning, you're not earning, right? You don't have time to sit in a therapist's office. You really don't. But you maybe can make time for it on the road, maybe. So make that possible. Make it possible to be accessible in terms that are relatable on a schedule that fits them. And yeah, that might be weird hours, so be it. This is yeah. what needs to happen to have meaningful supports. Morgan, thank you so much for hopping on today. I know this is part one of part two, but just the amount of value that you shared and just the support you're offering industry, greatly appreciated. So I just, again, I thank you so much. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Morgan, definitely check roadaheadcounseling.com as well as knightsoftheroad.ca. So road, um, road Ahead Counseling is Morgan's counseling company really believe in what she's doing because again as being a driver advocate i really appreciate anyone that takes as much time i'm um, studying as she has as well as just getting to know drivers in a really vulnerable state and the entire intent is to help and she really is helping she's phenomenal at what she does so i definitely highly recommend that you check her out um and just yeah visit her websites but again morgan thank you so much really really appreciate you joining for part one super hype for part two so all of our dedicated listeners definitely recommend that you wait uh, wait yeah for a couple more weeks for uh, part two to come out but again thank you so much and anyone that took the time to listen today again i just really appreciate you i appreciate the fact that you're investing your time in just yeah being introduced to our different industry leaders um especially morgan coming today it was super just awesome and i just i'm so grateful and yeah just thank you dedicated listeners as well as to our new listeners if this is the first time you've ever checked out the podcast just super grateful i really appreciate just your time and your investment so if you are listening to this on a podcast platform apple spotify google all that good stuff i do ask that you subscribe hit the like button even share it this was a really really in-depth episode that I'm just super proud of. And this is part of our We Got This ser uh, series. So it's all about mental health, mental health specifically in transportation. So I highly recommend that you share this out. Same thing, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, so that way you're notified of all upcoming episodes. And like I said, there is a part two. So we will see more again again in the next couple of weeks, which is just super awesome. And again, thank you so much for all your guys' support. Hope you have a wonderful day and let's create a pivotal impact. Bye.